Hey everyone, uh, so I'm Stefan Biene. Um, I'm one of the uh, Cython core developers. Um, before I start this talk, I'm going to show you a lot of examples of Cython, how to use it in different, different fields. Um, so I'd like to know uh, a bit what you're more interested in. So who's never used Cython before? That is some, it's true. That, you know, the, the little girl over there. Um, over there, right? Okay, yeah. Um, youngest non Cython user, we will introduce him to Cython today. Um, okay, so that's about one third of you. Uh, who is interested in integrating, so in accelerating NumPy code, computational code? Computational code, accelerating computational code with NumPy and all that. Okay, that seems a bit less than the group we just had. Um, uh, integrate, so talking to external libraries, integrating native code into Python, is that a topic for you? Raise your hands. A couple of people. Anyone using C++? Yeah, surprisingly not so few. Um, okay, so I'll try to focus a bit on what you just uh, said. Um, okay, starting with myself. So, uh, Stefan Bene, as I said, I'm a software uh, developer, data engineer, whatever you want to name it these days. Um, I've been using Python since 2002, and uh, I'm one of the uh, founders of this Python project. Not of the original inventors, but uh, when we forked the project from Pyrex, uh, that was in 2007, I was already on board. Um, and I'm also a CPython core dev since this year. Uh, I do training and consulting in-house, so if you want to know anything about Cython, have it taught in your uh, company at home, um, uh, you can contact me and I'll, I might come over and teach you something. I'll definitely have something to teach you, or look at your code and approve it. Um, I've been working for Trustio since 2017. Um, and I'll use that as a little introductory example because Trustio is a data company and that fits very well in the field. So what we do is um, we have terabytes of hotel guest reviews that we collect from all over the internet. Um, and when I say, say guest reviews, that's literally brain dumps of arbitrary people writing stuff on the internet, right? Um, so we collect them, uh, analyze them in 24 languages, so there's a lot of NLP involved. Um, uh, have surveys that we send out for the hotels, uh, collect them from portals, from partners that we have, do text and data analysis on them, uh, analyze sentiment, find out what people are talking about, what kind of different categories they, they are talking about, um, uh, analyze trends, find all this kind of information, sell that back to the hotels to tell them how they can improve. Right? So we can tell the hotels, um, you know, if you renovate your pool or hire someone new for the reception, you'll probably improve your score by 10%. That's what we tell them. Um, so this, is, this might also be interesting for you. So if you go to trustio.com and type in the name of hotels, next time you're looking for a good hotel somewhere, type it in there, and we'll tell you exactly what people actually think about this hotel, right? Notebookbooking.com wants to know, wants you to think about the hotel in order to book it. Um, we're independent, and so we can give you uh, the actual uh, opinions based on actual uh, reviews, actual data. So uh, go there, remember this, and um, you'll see it's, it's all cut down into different categories and all that, so it's really relevant information that you want to know before you book that hotel. Why do I tell you all this? Well, this, these are some tools that we use at Trustio. As I said, we're a data company, so we use NumPy, SciPy, we use Scikit-Learn for, uh, for things, we use Pandas for data analysis, we use NLTK and Spacey for text analysis, uh, LXML, whenever we have to deal with XML, uh, PyYaml for configuration and all this, and it's all based on uh, Hadoop processing uh, in, in Spark, uh, some MapReduce, some whatever Hadoop uh, provides, Hive and all these technologies. Um, so this is mostly what we do. Um, and now, most of these tools are actually partly or even entirely written in Cython. 
right? Who didn't know this? Raise your hand. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Um, NLTK is not, no longer entirely true because we are working on a patch for them. NLTK is a pure Python toolkit. Um, and so uh, I've written a PR for them to start compiling certain of their modules so that they just run faster if you install the binary instead of the Python package. So we're working on that. Um, Hadoop is straight out because it's most, most written in Java. But the rest is on our list. Uh, who's seen this? <laughs> Has anyone not seen it yet? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's the uh, image that the EHT project took off a black hole uh, a couple of months ago. And um, uh, the interesting thing about this, uh, the, this here um, is that these are the tools that they use for calculating this image out of the raw data. And as you may notice, they're all Python tools, right? They use pandas, numpy, astropy, uh, scikit image, over there, um, uh, SciPy, all these tools, all uh, Python tools for aggregating the, uh, again, I think it's, it's, it, they start with petabytes of data coming from eight different telescopes being taken across 10 days in a row, right? Like huge telescopes all around the world. Uh, collected the data, cut it down into manageable data sizes, and then calculated this image out of it, and that was all done in Python. And now if you look at the tools that they used, all of them actually used Cython inside, right? So that was a huge uh, Cython-based project, although they, though they didn't you know, largely advertise that, but it was. Um, okay, so what is Cython actually used for? It's used for uh, integrating native code with Python, it's used to speed up Python code in C Python, and some people even use it to write C, you know, without having to write C. Um, so basically, we write C so you don't have to. Okay. Uh, skip that. Uh, gradual typing. Does anyone know what gradual typing is? Heard the term before? Maybe in context with PEP 484, uh, the, the typing annotations in, in Python. So the basic idea is there are two main uh, different uh, f you know, ways to type languages. One is statically typed, which tends to be, you know, give, you, give you fast languages, but it tends to be cumbersome because you have you know, to type everything, and it's very annoying. And then there are dynamically typed languages like Python, which are easy to use, but tend to be slowish, kind of. Um, it's, it's not that simple, but more or less those are the two fields. And gradual typing is coming somewhere in between and says, um, you know, you can use typing where it helps, where it's documenting, where it makes things faster. That's where you should use typing. And for everything else, it's fine if you don't use it and don't need it there. So it was termed coined in uh, 2006. And there's a blog post, just use, look for what is gradual typing and you'll find it. And it was the basis for PEP for it for type annotations in Python. It's really the best mix of static and dynamic typing. Um, you can use dynamic typing for the ease of development and optional static typing for safety, speed, and documentation. And you should really only use static types where they help. Right? That's important. Um, and so don't type all your things. Right? There are limits to what you should use types in your code for. Um, and this is especially uh, important when it comes to Cython because what uh, Cython gives you is types in Python, and it uses them to accelerate your code. Okay? So Cython is a pragmatic programming language. It's gradual typing for Python, and it's an optimizing compiler. So it takes your Python code or your type annotated Python code uh, and compiles that, it translates it to C, and that compiles into a native extension module for Python that you can just import like any other binary module. It's production proven, it's widely used, as you've seen, there are lots of tools using it. And it's really all about getting things done in the same way that Python is. Uh, it helps you, keeps your focus on functionality, uh, removes the boilerplate for writing uh, native modules. It allows you to move freely between Python and C, you'll see that in a minute. Um, 
So it gives you a language that is as Pythonic as you want and as low level as you need it. Okay, so here's a demo. I'll make that bigger. Okay, um, who's never used a Jupyter Notebook? <laughs> Again, the kid over there, see? <laughs> Teach him. Um, so, uh, yeah, so pretty much almost everyone else did, and it's a very nice and interactive way uh, to use Python uh, to jump around in your code to show stuff. So what I have here is a uh, Jupyter Notebook, um, and as you probably also know, uh, Jupyter supports lots of different languages. Uh, um, I remember that it was 14 different languages like years ago, it's probably 20, 30, something in that order now. Um, and it supports Cython, so Cython is included in there. If you just say load x Cython and have Cython installed, obviously, then uh, that teaches it how to run Cython code, how to compile Cython code in a Jupyter cell. So I'll sh just show you what I'm using here. Uh, Python 3.7, um, fairly old version, but anyway. Uh, Cython 3, fairly new version. Uh, NumPy GCC 7. Um, oh yeah, and that's something I should mention. Since Cython compiles your, translates your code to C, um, what you need now is a C compiler, right? So Python is nice and easy, you write your Python code, you just run Python, run my code, and it runs it. Uh, in Cython, there's a compilation step before that, because in the end you get a natively compiled module, uh, native code, and that requires a C compiler. But that's it. That's all you pay. Um, okay. So, um, very simple example. I'm going to take the Python math module, import the sine function, and calculate sine of 5. Okay, it's a bit boring. I can do the same thing in Cython. And uh, one difference you notice here, uh, so first thing is, um, this is how I declare a Cython cell. I just tell Jupyter, you know, this cell is no longer running in Python. It needs translation uh, uh, with Cython, so it needs to be passed through Cython. Uh, please compile a binary module for me. And then what Jupyter does in the back is it imports that module and executes it along the way. And that's also the reason why there's a print statement down here uh, rather than just the you know, sign of five as you would know from Jupyter. So in Jupyter uh, cells, in Python cells, the last uh, result of an expression kind of falls out of the notebook and gets displayed. Um, and in a Cython cell, since the cell is compiled to native code, that doesn't work anymore. So Jupyter can't look into native code. It just executes some module and there's nothing falling out of it. So I have to explicitly say print. But that's fine, I think. Okay, gives it the same result. Um, now, as I said, since uh, Cython compiles uh, C code here, it translates the C code, um, I can start using C uh, functions now, um, or C functionality. And what I do here is I take the sign function from the libc math header. Right, so this is the C sign function. And for now, I'll just assign it to a variable. And then I can call that from Jupyter. Who's surprised? Anyone? No one? A couple of people over there? What's surprising here? Yeah, no compilation and nothing you can see. Um, so uh, the uh, Cython annotation up here uh, makes it a Cython cell, it compiles it for me. But the funny thing is, um, just by assigning the C sign function here, I can actually call it from Python. Right, so now Python knows how to call a C function. That's interesting. The reason for that is that Cython is a typed language, since C is a typed language. So the sign function is something it knows. It knows that it's a, function, uh, a C function that takes a double uh, um, floating point value in and outputs a double float or returns a double floating point value. So it notes the input and output values. And that allows Cython to directly wrap this function as a Python object. And when I assign it to a global Python name here, it does it for me. Because you know, that's an obvious assignment, right? I assign a C function to a Python variable. 
what else should it do than wrap it for me? Obvious, right? And it does it. So this is kind of the, the quickest way to wrap a simple C function for Python. Here's, here's the same thing uh, spelled out. So um, again, uh, asking Cython to learn what the C math header is. And then I write a Python function. Um, you can see the extension here allows me, so Cython allows me uh, to declare uh, C argument types as uh, I would in a C function. And then I can just call the sign function. And this is me manually wrapping uh, this C function call here in a Python function, which essentially does the same as above here. So it's non-automatic. So when I run this and down here, now I can call the Python function and it calls the C function internally. Um, okay, that's still a bit boring because as you've seen here, Cython can also do this happily f uh, on its own. It doesn't need my interaction, my code writing for this. Uh, so when, it, uh, when is the point when it becomes more interesting to do this? Uh, that's when you can move more functionality into the Cython layer, right? I can easily now call this uh, csign function up there that I just wrote uh, with x squared as input. But that would calculate the x squared in Python, then take the result of that, pass it into a C function, calculate that in C space and return it for me, and return that as a Python object again. If I do the squaring also in, uh, in Cython, then that gets translated into C code as well. And now the whole, uh, the whole um, expression, the whole um, function body itself um, uh, runs in C at C speed, rather than me doing something in Python, then in C, um, and then passing it back to Python. Okay? So the nice thing about Cython is that it allows me to um, move functionality freely between Python space, uh, Cython generated C space, and at the end also uh, the, the low level C written code. Um, and it's up to me as a developer to decide where I want to put my functionality, how I want to implement this. In some cases, I have an existing library, the C library, for example, that I want to call. I can just do that, right? I can um, declare it in Cython, call it from Cython code, do some more stuff in Cython space uh, to keep it at the, below the Python level. And when I'm done with it, then I return to Python, okay? So I have all three levels available in one programming language. And that gives me a lot of freedom for moving around, optimizing code um, uh, in these three levels of performance also. Okay. So here's a, an example I'll go through somewhat quickly. Uh, it's about um, uh, speeding up NumPy code. Okay. Uh, any questions so far on what I presented? Anything you would like to know or clarify or didn't understand? That I'm, I'm not always as clear as I want to be. I hope it was. Apparently I was, so thanks. Um, next example, NumPy. Um, so uh, the idea is we're going to calculate the average tax rate for Germany. I only have the numbers from 2016. Uh, uh, so they'll have to do, um, at the time, there were 44 million uh, um, people working, so in, um, paying income tax, let's put it that way. Uh, and the average at the time was uh, 3,703 euros per month. So the average income uh, was, at the time, uh, 44,000 euros. Okay, that was 2016. It probably didn't change that much. It's still, you know, it's still an average. Um, so the problem is, I then tried to find official data for this, and uh, I couldn't find anything really, probably due to data protection or something. Like there are probably a couple of people who earn that much that you would identify them by uh, their income. Um, so there's no official data for this, and what I did instead was, I just took a log normal distribution, fit it to um, 
the one data point that I have uh, made it kind of look good, uh, like this. And it's kind of not too far from what you would expect for an income distribution. Okay? So just assume this is you know, actual data. Okay. Uh, so let's calculate everyone's taxes. When you look up the uh, tax rate calculation uh, in Wikipedia, what it gives you is a beautiful Excel formula. This is actually German Excel, right? So it says when, and so that's, that's like if. Um, and then it gives you like, lots of formulas. So there are apparently different, uh, different, uh, different income ranges that uh, are chained against each other and that have different formulas for them to calculate uh, the tax rate. So the, the income tax for, for that uh, income range. Okay, so you can easily translate that into Python and it becomes this, which I think is a bit more readable, especially because it allows you to ignore the right sides of the formula here and just go, ah, look, there are different income ranges and then it does something. Just ignore the, the formulas, right? Uh, so this is how now the, the income tax is uh, calculated. And then in order to get the average tax rate, uh, uh, we take the sum of the taxes divided by the sum of the incomes. Okay. So, um, I'll type my, you know, kind of um, uh, fake income uh, list. I think I cut it down a bit. Um, I'm not taking the 44 million, that's just a, a fourth or so of them. And now, oh yeah, um, whenever you do timings, uh, don't forget to disable the energy management on your laptop because otherwise uh, you get funny numbers. Um, okay, so it's going to take a while. Uh, and I can already show this a bit. So what we're going to do here is, um, since we're optimizing this code, uh, I have a little function that just collects the different timings from different implementations. And so I remember the timing here, and then we'll use this function to uh, show the differences. So it took three seconds to calculate this whole thing in Python. Okay, so it's... 3.2, okay. Uh, so that's our baseline. Python has factor one. Now you can implement the same thing in NumPy, and um, uh, that gives you something like this. So we are slicing the income array, then doing some computations on them, uh, and then build the sums on it. Okay, and that's kind of heavy NumPy code, but yeah, that's how you can do it in NumPy. Uh, and now we can calculate the whole thing in NumPy. It should be faster. So we're down to 62.1. And that is 50 times faster than Python, okay? There's a different way to do this. Uh, still, you can take the Python function I've written and wrap it for NumPy so that it can apply it to the whole array, one item at a time. And then you can do the same formula, sum up the taxes and the incomes and divide one by the other. And that again is gonna take a while, that is slower than uh, the slicing version, but it should still be faster than the Python version we had. And it's faster by quite a bit. So that gives us 840 nine milliseconds, and that is four times faster than, than Python still, but it's uh, completely dwarfed by the NumPy version. Right. Okay, enter Cython. Here's a plain copy from the Python code I had above. Uh, it's doing the same thing, and now what I change is I compile the whole thing in Cython, and then do the calculation again. Maybe I shouldn't show this yet. Um, okay. Yeah, and as you can see, it takes a while to calculate this. Actually.
actually it already takes a while to well, all right, yeah, it's running here. Okay, so it takes 2.74 seconds. Oh. Yep. And um, as you can see, that is 17% faster than the Python version, which is nice, right? I mean, all we really added is this little line up here. And so, how much is that? So that's uh, eight characters for a 17% speed up. That certainly areas where that's acceptable, right? Okay, but we can certainly do better. Now, um, where Scython shines is static typing, and I told you about uh, gradual typing. So what we're going to do now here is we'll gradually start uh, typing the Scython code. And I'm going to use the uh, uh, pep for it for notation for it. So um, the income that the text function here is calculating is definitely some double, right? C double value. It's perfectly fine to represent that because it's you know some floating point and double is just fine for these calculations. Okay, and it returns. Well, it does some compula compilation uh, calculation afterwards. And so it definitely also returns uh, a double safely. Um, now, the next thing I notice is this function is only used internally inside of my module. I'm not expo exposing it anywhere. I'm really just using it down here. So what I can do is I can convert it to a C function, which is faster to call than a Python function because it has different call semantics. Um, and in C code, you can call C functions pretty much without overhead. In Python code, calling a Python function is a lot of overhead. Also in Cython code, calling a Python function is a lot of overhead because they are called with argument tuples, maybe keyword arguments even. Um, and so creating these objects, even just for calling uh, the function, takes a lot of time. In C, it's just passed by a stack or um, registered, a register, so that's very, very fast, as fast as it gets. So one thing I can do is I can declare this function as um, a C function, okay? And now when I compile this, um, up, uh -huh, yeah, then uh, Scython compiles it for me and I can time it again. And we're down to 205 milliseconds. So when I compare this to what we had before, up, that is now uh, that is now um, quite a bit faster than the Python version by uh, by 15 times. And the compiled version that we had before is still 13 times slower. So this was uh, a speed up by 13 times compared uh, to the version we had before. Why is that? Because uh, one thing is the call overhead that are completely removed. So this is, you know, that's kind of the, the inner function of my loop where I'm, I'm doing a lot of work, right? And the call overhead for that function was removed, so that calling that function, going into that function, is basically no time now. But the second thing happened. By typing the input and output arguments, uh, Scython understood this function better and managed to generate plain C code for it, because it knew now that income, you know, that's a C double. It didn't have to do any object comparisons anymore. It can calculate this whole thing in C space now. Right? So by, by typing some variables, by typing some arguments in there, Scython takes decisions about my code and adapts it to the variable types. And you can see that with a functionality called annotate. Uh, so Scython-A gives me um, HTML output. And in here, it replicates, uh, so it outputs an HTML snippet into my notebook that uh, replicates my code. And in here, sorry, in here you can see um, when I click on one line, 
this is just plain C code, right? Income greater than something. Uh, same thing here. Calculate formula, go to something, right? Um, in, in Python, that was looked, uh, would look a lot more involved. It would do lots of, C, uh, lots of Python C API operations, lots of, ob uh, lots of object operations along the way. And this now really generated plain C code. And it gives me a speed of 13 times. OK. OK. Um, so I would then continue this. There's a lot more I can do at this front. Uh, and I think the final speed up in the end that I usually have is uh, do I have it here? Uh, yeah. Um, so in the end, I usually manage to get it down to something like 11 milliseconds from the current 200. Right? So that is uh, another factor of almost 20. Okay? Um, I'm going to switch to a, a different example here. Um, so any questions regarding this topic so far? Okay, well, yeah, I think you were first over there. Uh, is the um, decorator cfunk the same as saying uh, cdef? Yes. Well, uh, cfunk is actually explicitly saying uh, this is a c function, which is the same as declaring as, as a cdef function. Right? Cdef has more meanings than that. So this is more specific. Um, uh, uh, for the others, the question was uh, there's a different syntax in, in Cython. Um, which is not uh, Python compatible. And uh, there's a special uh, file type also, which is PIX instead of PY, um, which allows you to use the syntax. And uh, I've only been using uh, Python syntax here. You can do the same thing in a special Cython syntax, which uh, is more relevant when you start talking to external C code, because that is a ground where you cannot uh, cover the same thing with Python compatible uh, functionality anymore, um, and that's where we use the second syntax. But uh, as you can see, you can get very far by just adding decorators, Python type annotations, and so on and so forth. Maybe making your code a little more C-ish uh, than it used to be. That also helps in a lot of cases. Okay, question over there. So if you if you were to actually have that in a in a code base. Would you put this part of the code on a PYX file, or would you have it in a Python file and only annotate? And, like, do you Cythonize the file and compile, and then you ship, or do you ship it, and then if you have Cython on the go, it knows that it needs to compile? Mm -hmm. So the question was, this is in a notebook, right, where it's nice you can uh, compile a cell or uh, use a Python cell, like, mix them as you wish. Um, how is that when you have code in a module, in the Python module? How do you optimize that? Uh, so Cython uh, compiles one module at a time, meaning you would normally pass the whole module through Cython and compile it. It rarely hurts to also speed up a couple of other places in your code without actually annota type annotating them. So if you just want to optimize one function, you can still compile the whole module. Right? It might not even be a bad idea. A um, uh, different choice is that you have, uh, one is, um, uh, Python often uh, uses this concept of, of an accelerator module where you have uh, a Python implementation of something and then you have an external native implementation of it which you import in the end and if the import works then you replace some function in the Python module with some faster function, something like this. Right? And you can do the same thing in Cython. Right? You can um, uh, externalize one function into a separate module compile it in Cython or not, and then import it from there. Right? And if it's compiled, then it's probably faster. If it's not compiled, then it's as fast as Python will run it. Or as PyPy will run it in that case, for example. Right? Um, so that is fairly nice. Um, the syntax actually allows you uh, to um, optionally compile code. Right? You can have it f as fast as PyPy can run it, and in CPython, you can compile it and get it as fast as CPython can run native code. Also nice. Um, OK. Uh, yep, that's, 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 I am currently looking for a little example that I had that was related. Yeah, OK. I mean, that answers your question, right? OK. Um, OK, anything else? 
Then the next example that I have is C++. Just a very quick example. Um, so as I said, uh, Cython generates C code by default, but it can also generate the C code into a C++ module, and that allows you to use C++ code along the way from your Cython code. And that is very nice from Cython, because uh, C++ is an object-oriented language, Python is an object-oriented language, so you can mix two object-oriented languages in the same Cython module, and they look totally like Python when you use them. Even C++ looks a lot like Python when you use it from, uh, from Cython, um, but it gives you a nice additional standard library, like fast data types, for example, fast container data types um, through STL, or anything you might be able to write in C++ yourself and want to wrap it for Cython. So that is a, um, a very nice addition to Cython, actually. And here's a very quick example. Um, one thing you have to change is you have to tell Cython explicitly that the language it should use is C++. There are, there's more than one way to do this, but this is a common one, especially from a notebook. And then that enables access to the C++ STL declarations that we already ship in Cython because they're so commonly used. And then you can use um, this syntax here to say, I have a variable v that's a C++ vector of ints, and then I just push a value in there and return the vector. What does this do? Returning a C++ vector from a Python function? What do you think happens? Yeah, it would transfer it to a list. Um, it would copy it into a list, right? Because the obvious representation of a C++ vector uh, in Python space would be something list-like, and you would use a Python list for that. So simply returning uh, something that uh, Cython understands as list-like will return, uh, will copy it into a list, Python list automatically, so it will create a Python list for you, copy all the values from the C++ vector into it and return that. Okay? All automatic. If you don't want that, you can implement your own little thing in whatever way. You can use a list comprehension uh, to get something out of the C++ vector. Um, or you can return a generator expression that uses the C++ vector. <laughs> you can do all these, these kind of um, weird things uh, by mixing Python features with C++ features. Um, but this is the most simple and most uh, straightforward way to do it. Okay, so when I call this function, uh, then I get 10 back, which is not very surprising. Um, this is a very common way to wrap C++ uh, objects for Python. Uh, I can use a so-called uh, so CDEF class. So CDEF class is um, uh, an extension type in, in Python. Right? So it's a native, so it's um, a low-level implemented class, like a Python class, uh, but implemented in C. And uh, in Cython, these extension types allow me to directly use C++ objects uh, as, class as, as instance attributes, that's an instance attribute, and I'm using a vector of int as values attribute, and then the lifetime of this C++ object is tied to the lifetime of the Python object. Right? So it's automatically created when I create my Python object, it's automatically deallocated for me when my Python object goes out of scope, so I don't have to care about any memory management, it's all automatic in this case. Right? Very nice. And so this is just a you know, very tiny example that uses an integer uh, yeah, list-like object, uh, wrapper object in, in, in Python. I can add values to it, which just uses the pushback uh, C++ function to push it into the uh, C++ vector. And as you can see from the usage here, that totally looks like I'm using Python code. Right? I'm calling a method on something. I don't care if it's a C++ object or a Python object. Just, you know, just call it. Uh, I also like the, the wrapper implementation here. What do you think this does? It runs wrapper on the list, right? So it does the same thing as we had before in the function. Uh, 
it uh, creates a Python list from the values. <laughs> this, is, this is actually very expensive, right? But hey, I mean, how often do I actually need wrapper, right? So um, what it does is it copies all the values in the Python list, uses wrapper on that, and then gives, gives the string back to Python. Uh, you know, if it's only something I you know, occasionally use, why not? Doesn't cost much. Okay, so much for C++. Any more questions on that field? I think last time I checked, you didn't have Bitvector. Oh, last time you checked, we didn't have Bitvector. Um, you mean in the C++ declarations that we ship? Might be. Um, please provide a pull request and we will happily add it. Anything else? A guild handling. Um, I actually have another example for that uh, as the next and last example that I'm shown. Okay, so here's an example of wrapping an external library. Okay, um, that's the last use case that I wanted to show here. And so far, we have seen, uh, you know, this, this C import, something libc math or so. Uh, it's a bit of magic. And this is unpacking the magic, kind of. What we ship is uh, Scython declarations of most of the C header uh, uh, set, of the C++ header set, uh, of the STL. Well, C++ is huge, but of, of much of the STL. Um, uh, and this is how it's spelled out in the end. There's a special syntax for that. And so what I want to do now is I write a little wrapper for the Lua runtime. Um, so I'll execute Lua code from Python. And for this, I just need to declare a couple of functions that the Lua API defines. And then up here, declare how to link against this. This is a bit of a hacky way to do this right in the notebook. There are more you know, nicer ways to do this from the setup file file, but this works for now. And then uh, once these are declared, I can use them in my code. So I define a Python function that takes a code string uh, converts it to ETF8 if it needs to, so it accepts Unicode and byte strings. So you can just use a you know a normal Python string uh, from Python 3 and pass it in there. Then creates a new Lua state, that's the Lua runtime representation. Uh, if that fails, then raises memory error. That is also fairly, fairly nice, right? Do you know what you ha would have to do um, in C in order to do this? Happily, there's a C API function for it, but just being able to say you know, do some C stuff if that fails, if I get a null pointer from some memory allocation back, raise memory error? <laughs> that is nice. That is what you want in your code. Um, so that's, uh, that's totally the, the Python way of doing it. So then I have a try and accept. Uh, sorry, try finally, and at the end of the finally, I delete the Lua runtime again. So if anything goes wrong along the way, um, then I make sure I clean up the memory, because C requires manual memory management, right? I'm responsible for cleaning everything up that goes wrong. And in Scython, I can use try finally, and it's just going to work. Uh, so here's Lua function to load the code into Lua, execute it from there, and then a tiny bit of return value adaptation. Um, to uh, return whatever number Lua wants to return here. Okay, just, I just quickly run this and notice that I didn't run the beginning. And then run it again. And uh, it fails because I didn't set up my Lua properly. Just believe me that this works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not the first time I've shown this example, it's just the first time it failed so heavily, so I'm not going to fix it right now in my last two minutes. Um, okay. Uh, uh, one title of that talk was uh, Scython 3. So, um, those of you who already use Scython will probably know that, you know, Scython is always this 0. Point something version kind of thing, right? It's 0. 0.29 currently. Uh, so what is this Scython 3? Where does that come from? Well, the last Scython version that we have is 0.29. So if you push the dot 
one digit to the right, then it, you know, and then it becomes three. The next obvious version is 3.0, right? Okay. So uh, that's kind of frightening, right? So you jump from 0. 0.7 point something to 3.0. Well, what's special about it? First thing is, Python 3 is Python. Now you're going to say, but it was always Python, so what's special about it? Well, it's Python 3. And now some of you might say, I could always put my Python 3 code in there. I just had to say, you know, language level equals 3, and then it compiled it. Well, it's Python 3 by default. So the language level is 3 by default. Um, so there are a couple of things that we change now in, um, in Python 3. Uh, it's Python 3 by default, so we're going to change mostly the um, standard configuration of the compiler to make it more modern, to move stuff that you know, isn't appropriate anymore these days. Um, and uh, we're going to adapt it to you know, today's Python 3 world. So these are the main changes in there. We're going to adapt to several PEPs that came along the way. Uh, and as I said, Python 3 by default, yes. Okay. Um, you can look up the, the Python, Python 3 milestone. There's still quite a bit to do uh, along the way, and we'll you know, try to get there. Okay. That's it for my side. Thanks for listening. <laughs>